Hey, to the Vintage family online, I wanted to say good morning. Um, we are going to do something different today than normal. We are actually, this is our, our, our staff meeting, and we're going to study the scriptures together in our staff meeting. And the reason is, uh, we have a guest um, this weekend uh, that we choose not to broadcast um, that event, just to protect the, the anonymity and to protect some of the things that, that we're doing around the world. And... Uh, I know that that feels like a, a very uh, veiled explanation, because it is, and the goal is to not draw a lot of attention, and so there are times in our culture where we just decide that maybe those things don't get to leave the room technically. They can, they can leave the room in people's hearts, but not on camera. So we're going to uh, we're gonna take some time right now, and so obviously if you uh, are with us this morning, you came ready to study the scriptures, so... I want to invite you to Psalm 133, and we're going to study the scriptures together. Uh, we're just we're spending some time praying through a couple ideas, and I felt like the Lord was whispering something that I think is actually for us in this room, but it's also for the online family. And um, I really felt like the Lord whispered the phrase about two minutes ago, um, the spirit of accusation. And... It, it kind of plays into what we're going to talk about and, and what we're going to study. But I want to just put a, a, a reminder in front of the family, in front of all of us, that partnership with accusation is partnership with hell. Because it means we're stepping into the weaponry of the enemy. And if I step into the weaponry of the enemy, I'm aligning with him. And our, our job as believers is to refuse an alignment with the demonic realm. In a lot of ways, we go, oh yeah, that's obvious. I can't align with pornography. I can't align with slander. I can't align with drug addiction. All, those are things of the enemy. But I think oftentimes we don't understand the power of both the, the accusational mind and the critical tongue. And I don't, I'm, I don't, I'm not really dealing with church right now. I'm dealing with life that a lot of times the, the, the scriptures, and this is so off track for where we were going, but here we go. The scriptures are very clear that he is the accuser of the brethren and blessing and cursing don't come out of the same conduit. So that tells me that I have to very clearly and very intentionally manage the mind gate and the mouth gate. Roy Hicks Jr. was a a guest teacher when I was at Christ for the Nations, and he made a statement that has shook me and stuck with me since I was 19 years old. And his statement was, the enemy loves to lead us into conversations that we shouldn't be a part of because he understands when things come out of our mouth, there's a creative force that was put into us by God, and they take root in our spirit when we speak them. In this way, just because you thought it doesn't make it wrong. We are to take our thoughts captive unto obedience. This is what Paul will teach us. As I think things and I recognize, ooh, that's not from the Lord, my job is to arrest it and let it go. When I let it leave my mouth gate, it becomes part of my person. It becomes part of, of, of my communication. Jesus will go a step further and say, so as a man thinks... In, in his heart, so is he, which his challenge for us is to think upon good things, to, to spend our time, spend our lives really giving ourselves into the things of the Lord. And that's why I think it's important for us to study the scriptures. It's important for us to sit in a place where we process our emotions with the Lord. Like sometimes the most healthy thing you can do is not talk to people, just talk to Jesus about it. Sit there and dump it out on the Lord. It's, there's, there's absolutely nothing you're going to ever say to Jesus that he hasn't heard at least once. You're not going to knock him off the throne with something that's going on in your heart. But you might knock somebody else off their trajectory if you share it with them. So I think this spirit of accusation thing is something the enemy loves to lead us into as the people of God. And he, it, it's, it can be so innocuous and so simple. And I want to just challenge us as, as believers, as family, uh, as a church, just as good human beings to make sure that our mind and our mouth are under the government of the Holy Spirit. Or we just say it this way. 
I mean, I, just, I got a lot of things I could say, but I can't. And when somebody says, well, what do you mean? Be like, yeah, sorry, you're not my God, I can't. But refuse, refuse to go there. Okay, uh, that, was, that was not part of the teaching, but let's go. Psalm 133. Super familiar uh, passage, and I think some of us probably know these things so instinctively that we quit studying these passages because we know them. Like this one, how wonderful it is, how pleasant when brothers live together in harmony. For harmony is as precious as the fragrant anointing oil that was poured over Aaron's head that ran down his beard and onto the border of his robe. Harmony is as refreshing as the dew from Mount Hermon that falls on the mountains of Zion. And the Lord has pronounced his blessing, even life forevermore. I don't know about you, but there's a tendency for me, if I'm familiar with it, I kind of quit studying it again. And I think there's a fun discipline to go back into the historic things that we know well and just be able to, to mine them out again. This one's been on my heart a lot lately. Uh, I think I, I quote it a lot, so I was perusing through it and uh, felt like, oh, I think there's some stuff here that is worth mining out. So we're going to do that uh, with our time. First thing I want to call out is that if we look at this in the original language in the Hebrew, the writer will say the first word is look. Almost like he's drawing your attention to something. Like when you yell at somebody to, uh, from across the room, hey, and you're trying to get their attention. That's in essence what he's doing. He's calling our attention to something he wants us to focus on. That thing he's calling our attention to is harmony. Harmony in Hebrew is a, a, what we call a pictorial language. language. So uh, a lot of... Um, Scholarly manuscripts will refer to the pictograph of the language, which is how, how was it drawn, how was it written. The original pictograph is a combination of two pictures. A walled fortress or a walled space could be a city, the idea of something being enclosed by walls. Uh, we're fairly familiar with that. Most of us would go into places that are enclosed by walls regularly. But it's a, it's a picture of that, but it's also a picture of a doorway. And the two pictures create an understanding of this word harmony at what is actually being aimed at in the word. The wall separates the inside from the outside, so the picture of harmony is the access point where the two spaces become one. So the focus in, in, in the pictograph is really the door. So the first aspect that the psalmist, uh, which this is David, this is King David. I, I, I like all the psalms, I think they're all awesome. But um, my, if I was put, to put them in line of my favorites, Moses's are my favorite, and then I like David's next. Um, because of the, who they were as men, how, who they were as pursuers of God. I just want to know what they have to say. So I love his statement, how wonderful and pleasant, because the root word carries a really specific meaning of something that is good and pleasing because it functions correctly. So like if you go into your garage and you pull out your lawnmower and you try to start it and it won't fire up, it is no longer a good and pleasing lawnmower. It is now an irritation because it doesn't do its job. The word in the Hebrew is about something that is good and is pleasing because it's properly functioning. So what he's talking about, if we're building our case, is he's talking about a door that functions correctly. Because the door in this pictograph is the focal point of what he's saying. The next picture he brings is of Aaron, which is the high priest. Aaron's the first high priest that, that Israel was given. And so it's a picture of the anointing oil ceremony. When we first read this without knowing what the context is, we're like, oh, they must have anointed the priests all the time. That was not a regular thing. This was something that was done at the moment he was inaugurated and brought into office. This would have been an event that there's absolutely no way David ever saw. He's too young to have seen it. So this event, when Aaron's placed as the priest, Aaron, I want you to think about who Aaron was. He's the one who would make atonement for the people of God. He was the protector, their protector before the Lord. So his role was to ensure the presence of God on the people of God. David's making a connection. This door called harmony is similar to this thing, Aaron, similar to this thing that happened in Aaron's life. 
I, I thought of a phrase when I was, was considering this passage. Part of Aaron's job for Israel was to erase offenses. He was there to erase offense. So, so David will make a really clear distinction to call out that this unity that he's talking about is like when the anointing oil covers everything descending down to the edge of the robes. I want to look at that picture for a second because mo- more than likely the, f- the, the, the root oil is olive oil that they're using. If you've ever cooked with olive oil, uh, it, it's, it's, pretty, it, it's pretty slippery. But I was thinking about the picture. He's talking about so much oil being poured onto Aaron's head that it runs down, saturates his beard, saturates his hair, saturates his clothing, makes it all the way down to the edge of his robe. That is not a light duty amount of oil. It's not like they took a teaspoon and anointed him. He is deluged in anointing oil. So for me, the picture that, that the psalmist is creating is that there's a sufficient amount. There's, that He's talking about this harmony thing. That there's so much of it that it saturates what it's being applied to. What David's, I think what David's intending to highlight is the effects of what harmony does. That it just, it's overwhelming. The next picture he gives is of dew. Is, I mean, they're, they're odd pictures if you think about them. He's like, yeah, how, how good is it? How pleasing is it when it's really functional? So I'm thinking about this. He's talking about family. He's talking about relationships. He's talking, about, really, there's no way to read this and not understand he's talking about, about people, interpersonal relationships. Because the word brothers here doesn't mean blood brothers that are of the same family. It, it, it really means people that we're connected to in life. So he uses this picture of do. Now, Mount Hermon is the tallest peak in Israel. It's the northernmost point of Israel, and it's, it's about 9,000 feet tall. It's perpetually snow-capped um, almost the entire year. The mountains of Zion are the southernmost part. So he's doing this, this word like play, which he's talking about from Aaron. It goes from the top to the bottom. For, for Israel, it goes from the top to the bottom. And he's talking about dew. Dew... In an, if you've ever been to the Middle East, you know it's a fairly arid climate. Most parts are dry. They're similar to our climate here in Colorado. Maybe a little more dry. In an arid climate, dew is the life-giving supply for things to grow. So David's picture is of a, what is a naturally dry region being blessed by what it needs to produce lush vegetation. So it's a declaration of health and production. If we put all this together, I think David is teaching something really significant that we should pay attention to. We have an option as to how we live as a family. We have an option as to how we live in our culture. We have an option as to how we live together as a church. That family, I want you to think about it as everybody your life touches. Work, school, church, all of it. The door comes back into play now. So how do we, how do, how do we interpret that? Because the wall is clearly symbolic of what would separate something. That's what walls are for. They define space. As I was studying this, what I kept thinking about was our propensity in our culture to define our individuality and to so jealously guard that space. And I I see this as a a picture of relationships. Um, The word phrase that he uses, where he says how how wonderful it is, how pleasant when brothers live together. The word for live here is to sit down. It's the idea of uh, being in a space, putting down roots. It's not transient. It's it's got a, a staying nature to it. It's those we do life with. So the walls are things that separate us. Maybe differences, maybe offenses, maybe belief sets. Anything that causes us to be isolated, I'm going to maybe consider it in our own space. The places where I just reclude. I don't know about you, but I have those. I think a lot of our lives are, are spent, even in our homes, fixated on the things that 
divide us instead of the things that unite us. Maybe we could say it this way, the walls cause us to isolate or separate. And I want, you, I want you to consider that for David, what causes the separation is never the issue. It's the separation that's the issue. So why is the door important in this passage? And I've never really taken a deep dive into Psalm 133 like this because it just seems so obvious. Oh yeah, cool, unity matters. Yay! But to really pay attention to what unity is, the door indicates an access point. For the psalmist, that access point is anything that creates opportunity and the reality for unity. It's what connects those two individual spaces. So we're talking about people, obviously, because that's what he's talking about. I think doors indicate the places we work to remain united and connected. Doors are a choice. I think doors are the key to unity. Now, we're doing a wordplay because he does a wordplay. We're using doors. What am I talking about doors? I mean access points. What I think that means to us as a family and our relationships is that if we want healthy and proper function as people, we have to become people that are more concerned with finding and creating doorways than we are with identifying walls. It doesn't mean the walls go away. That's what I love about this picture. It doesn't mean the things that we disagree on go away. That's actually not unity. Unity doesn't mean we all hold the exact same belief set. We all hold the exact same perspective. That's not unity. That is a weird, bizarre version of unity. That's not what the scriptures talk about. Unity or harmony is about refusing to allow isolation and separation in our relationships. You can be very united with somebody you disagree with. And what I love that the psalmist will say, and here's why I think it's so important, on this life choice to refuse to allow isolation or separation, on that life choice, there is a reality of commanded blessing. When I read this, I, I feel like I see the Lord stand up and yell, bless that. Like there's the force of heaven behind like, I'm going to bless that every time. It's never a question. When you fight for unity, I fight for you. I think if you consider where we're at as, as a nation, there's like this spirit of offense that's in the air in our culture. And I know a lot of us have lived with it. We've watched it on the news. We've dealt with the, maybe the personal realities of that thing. There's like this constant fighting for perspective and opinion. We look at the pandemic. We watched marriages break up over the fact that they couldn't figure out how to live together. Why? Because they let the walls be what they focused on instead of the door. We watch people disconnect from friendships and fellowships. and Why? Because they let the walls be what they focused on instead of the door. And yet here in Psalm 133, what David says is, you want to function properly? You want to be healthy? Be a door, not a wall. I want to invite us as a family just to consider our own hearts and our own places where we've allowed the door mindset to be there instead of the, I mean, the, the wall instead of the door. Have we let it develop in our home? What's the condition of your home? What's the condition with your friends? Maybe you're married and you're like, you know, we're, there's a lot of walls dividing us right now. Great, find a door. Work to find a door. Find the places that you love and you bless. COVID was really hard on everybody, I know that. I was on a flight um, one morning and I realized that I'd been really good at focusing on the things that bothered me. Uh, in my home, and I got really convicted by it. So I just sat down in, in an email, and I began to just create a list of all the things I loved about my wife and loved about our home. And it was, it was long, and I, I wrote 
really dumb stuff. I thought of every recipe I adored that she created. I thought of simple things like she's always on time with the bills and just everything I could think of. And I started just sobbing because I realized, like, I haven't done this enough. What I did was created a door. I didn't even know the concept, but I created an access point to share heart, to share connection, to share unity instead of focusing on what divides us. My point isn't to go, hey, I did a good job. My point is to say, we got to figure out how to do this in every relationship. Jesus is the master at this thing of figuring out a way to hang out with people that he disagreed with, but they couldn't shake the fact that they wanted to be around him. Why? Because he never focused on what divided them. He focused on what united them. I think we got to look at this in all of our relationships, in our church, in our city, in our jobs. I think to live this way, though, we have to do the work to both be a door and find doorways. If we all took the responsibility in all of our relationships to say, as far as it is unto me, I'm going to be at peace with all men. I'm going to figure out how to find peace with that person. I'm going to work for peace. We know that that's the story of Scripture, that we are to work for peace. And if, if we are letting our individual opinions define us to the level that we're really kind of unconcerned about others, we don't really care how they feel about where we're at. We don't, we don't really care how they feel about what I say. Whatever, it's my opinion. Deal with it. If that attitude's in us, that's a wall, church. That's not a door. We were studying it earlier in, in our staff meeting about where Proverbs and just talks about true humility and the simple idea that it really is about learning to value other people and, and not superimpose yourself over them feeling like it doesn't matter. My heart cry, we're in a series right now about stepping into our city. And what's it look like to really invest in our city? And I think it begins with maybe a really simple analogy. Be a door, not a wall. Love you guys. Looking forward to seeing you again next week.